All right, so uh, this is the session both about haptics and medical robotics. And so uh, I figured I would combine the two, and hopefully there'll be something for everyone who's at this session. Um, I've been interested in this field quite a bit, starting out in the field of haptics and then moving into medical robotics a little bit later in my career. And uh, my interest is in the role of human-machine interaction in surgical systems. Because as you know, many surgical robots today are teleoperated. There's a huge variety of different kinds of surgical robots um, in the world, as well as interventional radiology robots, and many of them require human interaction. Of course, there are many folks who are interested in autonomous surgical systems, uh, but at the moment, what's clinically feasible, what's legally feasible, are systems that have humans in the loop. So these are all the pictures of surgical robots I was going to show you while I was saying that. <laughs> and let's uh, re-examine actually what, what surgery is and how it's changed over the last 30 years or so. So originally we had open surgery where the surgeon put his or her hands directly inside the patient, had all sorts of great dexterity and tactile feedback during those hand tissue interactions. But what uh, the surgeon lacked was visualization um, and also the patient now has a big um, hole in them which increases recovery time uh, and likelihood of infection. So minimally invasive surgery began uh, becoming popular about 30 years ago and now we can go into patients bodies through very small holes, and the surgeon is operating instruments, sort of chopstick-like uh, manipulators with grippers on the end. And uh, this can be great for the patient in terms of lowering the invasiveness of the procedure, uh, but of course the surgeon's dexterity, as well as haptic feedback, is greatly degraded. So now over the last 15 years or so, surgeons are beginning to use uh, robot-assisted surgical systems, and this is a video of the da Vinci surgical system, which is currently the most popular uh, clinical robot of this type. And the goal now is that the page surgeon has to operate a master console, which then controls the patient side robot, which then controls the instrument and camera, which finally touches the patient. So now there's a lot of stuff in between the surgeon and the patient. And of course, the goal of many researchers is to try to take information about what's happening on that patient's side and feed it back into the master console, whether it be models, whether it be plans, whether it be visualization, and of course, haptics. All of this stuff, the goal is to try to enhance the user's experience. So uh, lots of people have different uh, interpretations of what the word haptics means. Here's the definition I like, which is that it really has anything to do with the sense of touch. So it's extremely broad. But of course, in haptic technology, we're trying to figure out um, what sort of haptic information are we trying to target when we give feedback to a user. And people in the haptics field typically uh, define two main areas of haptics, cutaneous feedback, that is things having to do with the skin, and kinesthetic feedback up there, which has to do with location, configuration of the limbs, and uh, large-scale force feedback. And of course, all of these senses, um, whether they're mechanoreceptors in the skin or receptors in the muscles, they all work together with the motor control system to coordinate movement and enable perception. Now, if we're thinking about adding haptic feedback to surgical systems, uh, it begs the question, why do we even need haptics? Why can't we just use sight? And um, I love this slide. This is um, something that Catherine Kuchenbecker had put together because it really um, highlights the dual nature of sight and touch. So for example, sight is centralized. The sensors are right here, whereas our touch sensors are distributed. They're all over the body. You have uh, sight is broad. That is, I can see all of you um, just by looking at you, uh, whereas touch is narrow. If I wanted to go over and reach Russ Taylor through touch, I'd have to go over and poke him, and that's a lot of work, and he might be offended. Uh, so touch is so different from vision in, in many, many aspects, and so you can imagine that things that touch is good for are probably not the things that are good that, that, that sight is good for, and vice versa. And so this may indicate where touch may or may not be needed in certain applications. All right, so why don't we have haptics in lots of surgical systems and teleoperated robots of all kinds today? Well, there's a number of challenges, and I like to divide them into the two sides of sensing and display. So on the sensing side, there's actually figuring out what is the information you need to record when a patient is interacting with the robot, which would then subsequently be displayed to a human operator. And so we have issues like biocompatibility, size, geometry, uh, degrees of freedom, and cost. And so some researchers have tried to get far away from dealing with the issue of, of actually building these sensors, although I have to say, especially in the last five years or so, great progress has been made in biocompatible, reasonable force sensors for this application. 
But many people look at force estimators. So rather than actually directly sensing the forces, you look at control effort and errors and try to estimate the force that's being applied to the patient, and then you feed that back to the master. The problem there is that the, the slave side or patient side dynamics are inherently felt by the human operator um, in the process of feeding those back. And so if you wanted to be able to subtract off the unwanted forces that have to do with robot dynamics and don't have to do with the environment, you have to have a really good model of your robot dynamics which might seem trivial, but considering the degrees of freedom and the fact that these are relatively small instruments that are often cable-driven, the dynamics themselves are very complicated. And so I think for us to go this route, we really have to think about how do you redesign surgical robots that are especially designed for that purpose. So those are our challenges on the sensing side. So what about the display side? Well, a ton of progress has been made in haptic displays over the last 10 or 20 years. Um, they're still in teleoperation, I'm sure as many of you know, um, a fundamental trade-off sort of due to the causality of, of information transfer uh, between stability and transparency. Transparency being the idea that you can feel everything that is happening on the, re happening on the remote side as if you yourself were directly touching it. And in force feedback, that is kinesthetic feedback, there's this fundamentally a, a trade-off between stability and transparency that we keep trying to push the envelope on with better sensors and faster computers, uh, but there's still going to be always a fundamental limit. Uh, the other issue is actually adding additional devices um, on to, say, your master manipulator in order to give better feedback. And there you still get into the same issues that we had with something like putting sensors on a slave side. Now we need to put actuators on a master side, and we have issues of sight, uh, size, weight, uh, bandwidth, spatial resolution, et cetera. And uh, many researchers have developed interesting solutions to that. So sort of laying out what I see are the problems, I'm going to give you a couple examples of some things that we've done in our lab over the years. This actually um, spans quite a, a while of time, where uh, we think about what are the different ways you can give haptic feedback and what might work and what doesn't. So let me start with an example of a study we did comparing force feedback, uh, both with haptic, that is kinesthetic feedback, on the master of a Da Vinci uh, custom research version of Da Vinci surgical robot, and comparing that to graphical feedback, which in this case, the graphical feedback is this bar graph that's going up and down, and that's just a, a visual display which is augmented onto the normal image that the surgeon would see, and it would be in 3D just like, just like the image they normally see. So there's an artificial, um, we call it a calcified artery, but it's really a coffee stir straw stuck in the tissue, and the goal of the surgeon who's doing this is try to palpate and figure out what is the orientation of that uh, calcified artery. So here's an example with some different types of feedback and how our expert surgeons who had used the da Vinci in surgeries with hundreds of humans before and how they did with and without haptic feedback in this orientation um, detection task. So when they had haptic and graphical together, or haptic alone, um, their error was quite small. And then with no haptic feedback, or that is just the regular visual feedback you would normally get, or with graphical feedback alone, they did much worse. And so it seems that in the case where you're actually trying to explore an environment and, and find something and identify it, having a kind of haptic map that you develop by exploration seems to be very important. And in this case, sensory substitution, that is using a graphical feedback to tell somebody how hard they're pushing, didn't work nearly as well as actually giving real haptic feedback. So this begs the question of what people are actually looking for when they're trying to explore, say, a tissue and try to find a tumor in it. All right, so here's an example of um, material and what the stiffness was. This is force versus position um, over an artery versus over the normal material that's surrounding it. And uh, of course, you've got um, noise both in the force sensors or in our force estimators, whichever method you're using. Uh, but you can see that clearly the forces, or the, the stiffness that you're going to feel will be different in those different locations. So if really what the person want to know, wants to know is what is the stiffness and what is not, instead of what is the force, um, maybe the method should actually not be to try to provide force feedback to give that information, but rather a stiffness map. Um, so here's an example of, uh, in this case, liver tissue. Um, this was actually pre-connect, and so we uh, sprinkled pepper onto the surface, not because we're going to eat the liver, but <laughs> in order to uh, actually create um, some uh, interesting features for stereo matching so we could do a 3D reconstruction. But in any case, uh, there's a hard lump inside this tissue, and as we palpate around, we locally determine, measure the stiffness, and then we feedback a, a visual display of what that stiffness distribution is. 
So um, some advantages is it gets directly to what you're looking for, which is not the particularly forced displacement relationship that you're feeling at any particular time, but rather what is the distribution of, of stiffness information. The disadvantage, of course, is that it, it takes some time, right? You have to go and palpate all over. Um, and there may be ways that a robot could do this autonomously or even assist a user to get this kind of data. So that was all exploration. And exploration, of course, is interesting because that's where uh, a lot of people don't feel that they can use clinical surgical robots without haptic feedback because they can't do those sorts of exploratory tasks. But currently, surgical robots are used all the time to do more manipulation type tasks. So in this case, a simple manipulation task is tying a suture. And the video on your uh, left has no graphical overlay. Can't really show you how the haptics feel, so I'm just going to go to a graphics um, sensory substitution example. And the one on the right has a dot which changes color depending on how much force is being applied to the suture. And uh, the interesting thing we found in this particular study is this sort of display um, helped a lot a certain group of users, which were not the expert da Vinci surgical system users, but rather novice users, people who are medically um, experienced, who had done sort of suturing tasks with their hands, uh, mostly residents, but not people who would actually use the robot in hundreds of, or thousands of surgeries. And uh, so this helped for novice robot-assisted surgeons, uh, but not for the two experts. So it also gets to the idea that maybe haptic feedback, the right place for it in robot-assisted surgery, in some cases, may be either for training purposes or as a sort of training wheels for people as they learn. As long as you uh, don't get people that rely on their training wheels, like my children have on their bicycles, uh, but that actually when you take it away, they're going to be better than they would have if they never had those training wheels at all. OK, so all of this so far was, was typical force feedback. Um, I think one of the most interesting things happening in haptics today is the idea of haptic illusions and using more tactile information. Rather than having motors on a stylus that pushes back at your hand, what can you do to the skin to stimulate it, to trick someone into feeling something that they're not? Um, and that's actually kind of the heart of haptics anyways, right? So um, I'll show you one example of something we did recently in my lab. Uh, my students, uh, Zan Song Kwek, Sam Shore, postdoc Lana Niski, and this is in collaboration with Will Provencher from the University of Utah. Uh, we've been interested in the role of skin stretch. Now, if you are holding a pen and you push on a surface, you do feel that kinesthetic force feedback but you also get local stretch on your skin, which tells you something about, uh, about how much force is being applied. But you get that information cutaneously. And so we thought if we took some of Will Proventure's skin stretch devices, could we trick users into thinking they were feeling forces when we were only stretching their skin? Or could you also augment force feedback? That is, if you could only turn up the gain so much on your teleoperation force feedback controller because of stability issues, could you crank up that effective force feedback more by providing additional skin stretch. And so we did this in uh, both virtual environments as well as a teleoperator here. And this video is probably better for showing how this little skin stretch tactor moves. So I'm going to move the fingers out of the way just so you can see that little red tactor move up and down as you teleoperate. And it turns out that this approach is very effective. It's kind of this haptic illusion where we trick the user into feeling more force than they're actually feeling through this extra skin stretch feedback. And if we compare augmentation with skin stretch, or sorry, skin stretch alone, this is actually sensory substitution with, from force feedback to skin stretch, um, versus conventional force feedback, versus reduced force, which is where we, we turn down the gains um, to a, a, another type of sensory substitution, which would be graphical feedback or vibration feedback, uh, we actually had much less error in doing the same sort of coffee stir straw identification task um, when you had any of these skin or stretch or force feedback techniques uh, because it seems to be more intuitive for users to think of that skin stretch as a force substitute than these other types of sensory substitution. And so with this being quite promising, we recently uh, developed some much more complicated looking skin stretch devices. This is actually a six degree of freedom skin stretch feedback device where you can hold on to it with multiple fingers and uh, you can get torque information as well by moving two of these tactors relative to each other. So we put this onto a, a Da Vinci master and are starting to look at um, how can this sort of sophisticated skin stretch feedback help people perform tasks. All right, so I would be remiss in talking about uh, robot-assisted surgery and haptics if I didn't talk about uh, training. And of course, there's a whole bunch of literature um, and an ongoing work being done in surgical simulation. Uh, I want to be a little more specific here about not training people to do any old surgery, 
but how do we have to think about training people to do robot-assisted surgery? I mentioned before that we might be able to use haptics as some kind of um, haptic training wheels, uh, but let's also just look at how people perform when they do surgery. And one of the things I've been very interested in is uh, what is the role of human motor control in, in training and uh, what does the, the idea of the dynamics of the robot and how it's designed and how our controllers are built actually affect that? Because uh, the question is, could haptics be used in this training? Or um, could uh, the idea of haptic feedback actually be used to redesign these robots? So here's an example of a study uh, conducted by Ilana Nitsky, uh, where we actually instrumented a bunch of surgeons as they teleoperated with a commercial da Vinci surgical system. Uh, but rather than doing typical clinical tasks, they did some very simple kind of point-to-point -point reaches like is classically done in neuroscience motor control studies, only they did it with a da Vinci master. And we used experts as well as novices. And uh, they did this task both by moving freehand as well as teleoperating uh, the robot itself. Now, here are, are two examples of, uh, of how people performed. One of them is the expert, and which one is the novice? Uh, so, so one is the expert and one is the novice. Uh, you can probably, looking at this, pretty quickly guess in making these simple point-to-point -point movements with a da Vinci master. Although it has nothing to do with clinical skill, all it has to do is moving from point to point in space, uh, you can still probably guess which one is the novice and which one is the expert. So I'm sure you all have your, your easy guess there, and <laughs> there's the answer. Right? So even though this has nothing to do with surgical skill, it has something to do with the user's adaptation and learned manipulation ability with the surgical system. So we look very closely at how people move with the da Vinci. I don't think I have time to get into all of these details, but the main thing I want to point out is that people do move very differently in teleoperation and freehand, and experts move much better than novices. And inherently, the result is that the dynamics of the master manipulator actually really matter in terms of people learning to use the surgical robot and what their ultimate performance is. And the reason why this is connected to haptics is that haptics could be used in this training. Uh, some concepts about haptic design and the way the robot feels might also be able to impact training and how we decide to design uh, the robot itself. Great, so I have a few minutes left, and I wanted to spend uh, the end sort of concluding with some thoughts that I had about challenges and opportunities in the field of haptics. So I have a few slides on this. Um, so I think a, one of the most exciting things that is happening in haptics right now is the idea of surface haptics. And here's a few examples of different types of surface haptics devices. Um, this is uh, Tesla Touch from Disney Research. They and several other groups around the world are looking at electrostatic tactile displays. So how do you um, sort of use lateral forces to let people know something about an environment? Uh, right now, these are really limited to flat, hard screens, <laughs> which doesn't really uh, serve itself well to surgery, but it's interesting. Um, my lab has been working on some surgical simulators or medical simulators and creating um, sort of strange devices <laughs> which actually change both their geometry as well as their mechanical properties um, using a particle jamming approach. And then the company up there, Tactus Technology, is actually using microfluidics to make little bubbles that kind of bump up onto a flat surface. So all of these are surface haptics in that the user has to reach out their hand and explore it. And all of these are really interesting opportunities. Um, and uh, I think we should be thinking about how these types of haptic displays might actually be used in some sort of useful feedback in an actual teleoperation task, whether it be surgery or space robotics or anything. Another area um, that actually I think there are a lot of talks in this session coming up about sort of snake-like surgical robots and steerable needles. Uh, these are interesting, relatively new types of medical robot. And uh, we don't really know what the user interfaces should look like for these devices. Uh, so this is a really interesting video from Bob Webster's group at Vanderbilt University where they're controlling their active cannula robot using a leap motion controller. So that's why the person's moving their hand in space and yet the robot is, is being teleoperated from that movement. So how do we give haptic feedback for this sort of strange shaped robot? Is it really just about tip control or do we want to be able to control the whole shape of it, maybe using the whole arm, using technologies like this? And if you have steerable needles that are basically subject to non-holonomic constraints, um, should you provide some sort of force feedback to guide the user to not um, get in trouble in terms of trying to move the steerable needle in directions that it just can't move? And uh, finally, we have uh, some uh, great work being done on um, getting the geometry of the environments through um, 
uh, RG, uh, RGBD uh, type cameras, so like using a Kinect, and then being able to do haptic rendering based on that. The problem there is you only have geometrical information. And so um, is that still useful because it doesn't really give you any mechanical interaction data? Or is there more that we can do with this sort of information? And um, other interesting things and in haptic feedback versus guidance, the role of training. And uh, in general, we have to do a lot of user studies in haptics, and we would like to know how can we get around that. So thank you very much for your time. Hello, everyone. My name is Giuseppe Oriolo. I'm not one of the authors of this paper. Uh, Domenico Pratichizzo, my friend, was supposed to give this presentation, but he had a last-minute problem, couldn't make it to Chicago, and asked me to fill in for him. So here goes. Uh, needle insertion in soft tissue is a minimally invasive surgical procedure which demands high accuracy. Robotic systems with autonomous control algorithms have been exploited to achieve high accuracy and reliability. However, for reasons of safety and acceptance by the medical community, autonomous robotic control is often not desirable. For this reason, it is important to focus also on techniques enabling clinicians to directly control the motion of the surgical tool. This work addresses the challenge and presents a novel teleoperated robotic system which is able to steer flexible needles. It enables clinicians to directly maneuver the surgical tool while providing them with navigation cues through kinesthetic and vibratory force feedback. The system tracks the position of the needle using an ultrasound imaging system, and from that it computes the needle's ideal position and orientation to reach a given target. The master haptic interface then provides mixed kinesthetic vibratory navigation cues about this ideal position and orientation uh, to the clinician as he steers the needle. Six subjects carried out an experiment of teleoperated needle insertion into a soft tissue phantom. They showed a mean targeting error of 1.36 millimeters, which is, as expected, worse than autonomous approaches, but still sufficient to reach the smallest lesions that are detectable using state-of-the-art ultrasound imaging system. There was a third video, but I can get it to play. Anyway, it was about an additional experiment of remote teleoperation of flexible needles uh, carried out to highlight the stability of this uh, proposed system. The master robot was placed in Genoa in Italy, while the slave system was in Enschede in the Netherlands. Uh, results have showed a targeting error of 0 0.71 millimeters, which is very similar to that um, obtained uh, in advance. Okay. Good afternoon. My name. Uh, I'm going to start to present the work done by me, Ricardo Martins, Professor João Felipe Ferreira, and Professor Jorge Dias from University of Coimbra, Portugal. This work describes the touch attention basin models involved in the active haptic exploration of surfaces by robotic hands. The main motivation of this work is the a new generation of robotics platforms that uses their advanced manipulation capabilities to interact and perceive the surrounding environments. Um, in, scenario, in challenging scenarios such as domestic health care or entertainment facilities, these new type of scenarios uh, requires the development of new capabilities that, that robotic platforms need to perform uh, autonomous interaction in noisy and dynamic environments. This work contributes to those challenges by proposing methods to perform the active haptic exploration in a, of unknown and noisy environments and methods to learn and generalize the exploration strategies. In this work, the scenarios were implemented in simulation environment. The robotic platform was placed in front of a table. 
the workspace has a, a known structure to the robotic platform, and it is made of two different materials in this case, uh, wood and silicon. The robot starts by performing a local exploration of the surface, acquiring haptic sensory data, and extracting, uh, extracting haptic features like compliance and texture. These features are uh, integrated by a Bayesian model that then infers the category of material of that subregion of the workspace. The, the result of that inference process is also used to update the perceptual representation of the full of the workspace. Together, the updated representation and the task objectives are, are also used to extract additional maps like haptic saliency map, inhibition of return maps, and uncertainty maps that are used by a second Bayesian model to infer the next, next exploration target that the robot should, should uh, search. Uh, this work has been tested in three different configurations of the workspace with the discontinuity having different geometries and different uh, uh, variations of slope. And in general terms, the um, structure of the discontinuity that was recovered uh, has a good accuracy when compared with the benchmark uh, benchmarks. So if you have any questions about this work, please contact me. Hello, everybody. My name is Nabil Zemiti. I'm an associate professor from the robotic department of the LIRM of uh, Montpellier in France. I'm going to present you our preliminary result on the design and evaluation of uh, one degree of freedom electroerological fluid based needle insertion haptic platform. So, first of all, what is the context of this work? It's percutaneous procedures, it consists in inserting thin instrument into the patient. Uh, in, to, uh, to perform diagnosis or local therapy under uh, image guidance. So as you can imagine, there are many advantages of uh, performing this percutaneously, less invasive procedures, reduced trauma, and so on. But we have also many difficulties, such as the precision of the gesture, the needle deflection, and the success depends strongly on the, uh, of, uh, on the expertise sorry, of the radiologist. So that's why there is a big demand from the radiologist to develop a training and simulation platform for needle insertion procedures. And if we take a look very quickly to the state of the art, at this moment and to our knowledge, all what have been described in the literature concern only the modeling of the needle tissue interaction using, for instance, FEM modeling. And all the proposed simulator use conventional and commercially available motor-based haptic device, such as Omega device for force demotion or uh, phantoms, and all these devices are active uh, uh, haptic devices. So our contribution consists mainly in developing a passive one degrees of freedom needle insertion haptic device based on electroerological fluids, brakes. These fluids are passive devices, so they don't have problem of uh, stability and safety uh, compared to active devices. And we developed also a force controller of this platform that allows to simulate different tissue behaviors against the, the needle movement, which means that when the surgeons manipulate this platform, they can feel different tissue uh, interactions, such as uh, the skin, bladder, and so on. It depends on the platform. And for validating this work, what we have done it's, we performed many experiments using a robot, uh, robotized needle insertion into multi-layer ex vivo tissue, and we got a big database of needle insertion uh, forces. And we fed back this force as a, as a desired force for our force controller uh, of the platform. And as you can see in this uh, curve, uh, we have compared, uh, we have performed this uh, work with, uh, by a robot and compared the desired and the measured force. And you can see that the electroerological fluids are a very good candidate to realize a uh, needle simulator uh, platform. And you can come tomorrow morning to see the results on the. Uh, good afternoon to every one of you. Uh, 
I'm here to present the paper on haptic enabled teleoperation of base excited hydraulic manipulators applied to lifeline maintenance. I am not the author of the paper. I'm Rohan Thakkar presenting this paper on behalf of Bikram Bandia because he couldn't make it today. And yes, sir, Subramaniam and Nariman are the other authors for this paper. So the main motivation was to maintain an overhead power system that is difficult to uh, that is difficult task to perform, especially in places with severe climatic conditions, mainly because of the power that is involved, which is going through these lines. So it is important to increase the safety for the convenience of the human operators. So here's the development concept. So the main idea is to use a master PC, which were, which you can see on the left side, which would be uh, controlling the slave side, uh, where the slave manipulator with the hot stick will be handling the actual insulators on the transmission line. And the three main challenges are designing a force feedback control system, wirelessly controlling the whole platform because you don't want the wires to get entangled with the mecha mechanism or other vehicles which might come into the way and compensation for base excitations of the slave manipulator. Since the length of this mechanism is pretty long, there might be vibrations from the vehicles at the bottom. You don't want that. So this is the experimental setup which was used to test in the lab. And this slide shows the equation which we used to uh, govern the compensating force for the haptic feedback and the force is in the opposite direction, like you feel a reaction force in your hand. So these are the three sample tasks which we used for testing, twisting the wire, pulling out a quarter pin and inserting a pin. And here's a comparison of the results where we have the force enabled in the upper one and the force, sorry, force disabled in the upper one and the force enabled below. So it can be seen clearly that the deviation from the desired and the actual uh, desired and the actual trajectories is different, and thus having force enabled is a better option. So it can also be seen from these two graphs: uh, the position error at the slave end effector is less in when the force is enabled, and these are the other results. So we can have a detailed talk in the interactive session on this. Thank you. So, good afternoon. My name is Vincenzo Lipiello. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Naples, Federico II. My talk is about a mixed initiative control system for aerial service vehicles supported by force feedback. Co-author of this paper are my colleagues, uh, Jonathan Kakashi and Alberto Finzi. As you probably know, uh, during the last years, several researchers are paying their attention to uh, aerial service robotics. Moreover, several research projects are born to increase the operational capabilities of a new generation of UAVs. Particularly, they are trying to move from typical navigation operations towards more complex tasks like uh, sample grasping, wall inspection, manipulation, bimanual manipulation, all in natural and collateral environment. To achieve this kind of task, often uh, both autonomous and uh, teleoperated uh, control modalities are required. Um, well, in this paper, we propose a mixed initiative control for aerial service vehicle, where sliding autonomy is supported by a mixed initiative planning and haptic feedback. In particular, we assume to use an autonomous control able to plan and execute in real time a navigation task. The operator acts as a supervisor by asking a level task, but also at low level by acting with a, an acting device uh, applying, by applying a, a, a local adjustment of the uh, navigation uh, path and of the trajectory. And this can be useful, for example, uh, to uh, avoid the known obstacles or to move the vehicle close to interesting points that are observed during navigation. Moreover, the active feedback helps the operator to recover, if required, the planet trajectory by feeling the deviation of the 
uh, current position of the vehicle with respect to the plan. On the other hand, if the, this deviation uh, comes outside to an allowed deviation envelope, the autonomous system broke the, the current plan and the autonomous replan a new uh, trajectory that uh, well fit with the current uh, human intention. So we uh, performed several tests, both in virtual and in real cases, by involving a group of 20 students. All the achieved results demonstrate that the uh, adopted force rendering solution increased the performance of the system. So thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope to see you tomorrow morning during the interactive session. Hi, my name is Yu Wang. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Utah, working with Dr. Mark Miner. Our research focuses on an innovative haptic footwear device named the Smart Shoe, which modulates foot ground interaction for a haptic ter terrain display or compensation of terrain irregularities. The Smart Shoe consists of a cellular bladder structure replacing a standard shoe sole haptic display of the different terrain features is achieved by modulating, uh, by operating valves embedded inside the elastomeric structure to vary the bladder pressure and sole height. Therefore, uh, features such as terrain unevenness, size slope, uh, cobble rocks, and surface compliance can be rendered. Moreover, the smart shoe will also be applied in the real world to compensate uneven terrain and to exert forces for fall prevention. Motivation. So falls are the second most costly form of uh, injury in the United States, especially in elderly populations and Parkinson's disease patients. We are developing gait therapy for PD patients in a VR environment to improve gait characteristics and reduce likelihood of falls. Our training protocol combines the SARCOS Traport and a new VR environment to graphically render terrain features in 3D while the smart shoe physically displays the terrain features as the subject step on them. The smart shoe is fabricated with a multi-layer molding technique using a two-part liquid silicon rubber. At its core is a cellular bladder structure which is divided into seven chambers based upon the foot anatomy and the biomechanical foot pressure profile. The elasticity and compliance of the rubber bladder structure enables the passive deflation and reinflation of the shoe as the user steps on it without using extra energy to actuate it. A compact PCB board and a solenoid valve are embedded in each chamber, providing pressure and distance feedback, as well as the control of the air pressure. Three groups of, of experiments, including standing, foot motion pattern rendering, as shown in the video, and, um, and rock, random rock display were implemented with six test subjects. The subjects were able to perceive foot uh, motion created by the smart shoe, including rock display, but they did comment that they could feel the support structure. Future work focuses on improved ladder design, incorporation of a shoe upper, and haptic rendering of terrain features. I look forward to discussing our research during the interactive session. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. I'm Hyung Kyung Kim from post Korea, and I'll introduce the contact force decomposition method using tactile, sense, <coughs> tactile information for haptic augmented reality. First, I explain about <coughs> what haptic augmented reality, haptic AR is. Typical haptic rendering in virtual reality generates haptic feedback force to represent the haptic interaction between finger and virtual objects. In contrast, haptic AR <coughs> modulates the haptic interaction between finger and real object by applying additional force, as shown in this slide. For the exact modulation, we have to know <coughs> about both deformation and the force, but we cannot know deformation directly, so it should be estimated. In order to estimate the deformation, contact force should be decomposed into the deformation force and friction. Current haptic AR framework, <coughs> framework uses nominal geometry, which is undeformed geometry of the object in the force decomposition. 
However, this method makes some problems if there exist multiple contact points since the contact <coughs> of one finger changes the contact condition of the other fingers, it leads the decomposed forces to be far from the actual forces. To overcome this limitation, we propose a contact force decomposition method using tactile information, which is contact pressure. We can find the direction of deformation from contact pressure without knowing any geometry information. Also, we can, the contact pressure can be obtained at each area <coughs> of contact independently, so the proposed method can be expanded to the multi-finger case easily. This slide shows the essential location for obtaining deformation force from the contact pressure. As shown in the equation, we can obtain deformation force by simple integration of contact pressure along the contact surface. This video shows the performance of the proposed method via Abaco simulation results. The <coughs> estimated Coulomb friction coefficient using proposed method is more exact than the <coughs> that using nominal geometry, which means that the proposed method decomposes contact force more exactly. And the proposed method also implemented now actual haptic AR framework, framework currently under which is currently under development. And th this video shows the decomposition result of actual contact force in real time. And also currently we are developing deformation estimation method for haptic AR using the proposed method. And this slide shows the initial result of that. And this is the end of my presentation, presentation and I hope to more detailed discussion in the interactive session later. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. We're having a bit of technical difficulties here. There looks like a pin that's bent inside this thing. So all of you on this side are going to have purple uh, videos or purple slides. So uh, anyways, let's just bear with me for a second. My name is Chris Hauser. Uh, I'm from Indiana University, or was from Indiana University. Now I'm at Duke. Uh, this work is with uh, co-authors Anna Eilering and uh, Julia Franchi. And, and I would have to say that Anna is the uh, really the, the, the ringmaster of this work. She's a very talented undergrad. Uh, and the idea uh, behind this work is to develop new teleoperation devices using maker technology like 3D printing. Uh, so the thing with uh, teleoperation devices, like uh, buttons or joysticks, they're used quite often for explosive ordnance disposal robots and other kinds of robots. They're really quite unintuitive. Uh, on the, uh, the alternative is that you can use haptic devices, but uh, there are some uh, drawbacks about these as well. Uh, first of all, they're actually quite expensive, so they're out of the reach of uh, normal uh, users, like everyday users at, in their homes. Uh, and also, they, are not, they don't have a one-to-one -one mapping be between the input device and the target robot. Uh, on the other hand, people who do programming de by demonstration uh, do kinesthetic teaching, which is a really intuitive way of programming robots by, by moving them around physically. Um, so what we're trying to do is combine the strengths of all these approaches and create a device that lets uh, the masses, essentially anybody uh, out there, uh, be able to teleoperate their robot using an inexpensive input device. Uh, so the RoboPuppet method is a, uh, a several-step method. First of all, you take your CAD models of your target robot, and you pre-process them by carving out some geometry uh, to put in these pre-assembled uh, pre uh, encoder modules that we have plans for uh, available. Uh, you then 3D print the parts, then you assemble the parts, and there you have your RoboPuppet. Once you have your puppet, you have a calibration step to calibrate the reverse mapping from the, uh, the, imp the, the puppet's angles to the uh, target robot's angles. And there's also some collision and dynamics filtering that you use to try to keep the robot safe uh, when it's operating in its remote environment. Uh, so it's really quite easy to use. It's very inexpensive. This target, this uh, prototype robot that we made was $85, uh, and people really like to use it. Very, uh, uh, it's, it's it's very fun to use. Uh, this is a college student that was using it. This is a 12-year-old child that uh, was able to pick it up and use it just right off the bat without any instruction. Um, and what what you can see, if you want to have this be used with kids uh, with a very uh, heavy robot like this industrial robot arm, it's about 250 pounds. You really need to have the safety filtering. Uh, and we also tested it on this uh, this kid's younger sister, seven-year-old child. You really need some safety filtering. But if you're interested in getting our plans, uh, our modules, and our software uh, for doing the, the collision filtering, uh, please visit robopuppet.org and come see me at the poster. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rodrigo Hamisola, and tonight, uh, this afternoon, I'm going to present our paper from the Italian Institute of Te Technology entitled Haptic Exploration of Unknown Surfaces with Discontinuities. I co-authored this paper with Petra Komashev, Antonio Bicchi, and Dar Darwin Caldwell. 
the problem that we are dealing with here is how do we exert a normal force uh, that is always normal to the surface when there are discontinuities in the surface. For example, as you move from point A to, to B to C, where there is a block in point B, how do you, in, at point A, we need to exert a normal force that is downward, and at point B, you need to go around, around it and go to point C. And so in this surface, we can see that it has many discontinuities. And so the state of the art is that we have a compliant motion. In compliant motion, this one is uh, the, for, the robot is able to exert a normal force on the surface, but the surface doesn't have any discontinuities. So we have two methods. Uh, first method is uh, superposition of motion and force control, where we assigned alpha and beta. When alpha is equal to one and beta equal to zero, our normal force is going downward. And when alpha is uh, zero and beta is one, our normal force is going towards the right. And the second uh, method is uh, we have rotation of control axis and for of force and motion. For example, as the end effector of the robot moves from uh, point A to B to C, your, your, our normal force is, go, is going down, or excuse me, and then it is being blocked by this, uh, okay, sorry, and then now we have our experimental results. We, uh, we have a wooden stool where the KUKA robot arm is going to go around that surface. It will exert a normal force of 10 newtons all the time. Now it's for, uh, it's now in this uh, object, we have a triangular object it has a 120 degrees turn, abrupt turn at the edge. And the third object is a box. It has a longer uh, surface to explore for the uh, paint brush or this paint roller. And so as we can see, the robot is able to exert, uh, to change the force from normal going downward and normal going so uh, sideways. And in this case, we are experimenting the same wooden block where it has several discontinuities at the bottom. We, and so we can see that the robot is able to explore that surface. And this is method two for the same object. The control of, uh, we rotate the axis of control. And uh, as we can see, the robot is still able to do uh, the required task. And so several uh, applications of this probably is uh, uh, some, uh, of course, obviously painting of walls of, from floor to ceiling and also of uh, inspection of surfaces for example, bridges and uh, other objects. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. So, good afternoon. I am uh, Alessandro Serio from uh, Centro Piaggio and uh, IIT. I'm presenting the work, The Patched Intrinsic Tactile Object, a tool to investigate human grasps. So, and uh, in this work, uh, we want to use uh, robot sensing technologies in order to characterize a human grasp. Uh, basically, we want to use a tactile sensor in order to uh, characterize our grasps. So we need a device uh, <coughs> capable of uh, uh, changing it, its shape, that hollow natural grasp, and uh, a device uh, capable of measuring finger, fingertips for torque, so for each finger, in contact with an object, we want to measure the related force and torques. And we want a device capable of uh, computing contact points. We propose uh, the patched intrinsic tactile object, as you can see in the figure. The patched intrinsic tactile object is um, a sensorized object capable of multi-touch detection. Uh, the core uh, is the the core of the object is the the cube uh, here the black uh, the uh, the black cube uh, the black cube is a 36 axis for torque sensor and uh, each face is a six axis for torque sensor on each face uh, we can fix different patches in order to compose in order to build a different uh, object well in uh, my interactive presentation. Uh, you will see the hardware design of the PITO. You will see the calibration procedure. You have to consider that uh, uh, a 36 axis four torque sensor is not a standard four torque sensor. So uh, we have developed a different calibration procedure, different calibration method in order to consider the, the ob object in its entire structure. And then 
you will see the contact point computation at the, the algorithm. Finally, in uh, some experiment, you will see the PITO at work as uh, in this video. So I think that's it. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Bergnokars, and I'm presenting our work today on workspace characterization for concentric tube continuum robots. Concentric tube manipulators are composed of multiple pre-curved component tubes that are usually made of a shape memory alloy, like nickel titan, and that's used in its super elastic phase. So that means that once you release stress on these tubes, they return to their um, initial curvature, as you can see on the video. And by inserting these tubes and arranging them concentrically, and then by translating and rotating the base of each tube, we can achieve a tentacle-like motion, as we can see here in the video. This is probably one of the smallest con continuum robots, since the tubes have diameters below two millimeters. Looking to task-specific design, it starts off with a selection of tubes in terms of their length, diameter, wall thickness, and material followed by a pre-bending of each tube into any segmental pre-curvature that one desires. And that gives us the manipulator by composing these tubes concentrically. And in this particular presentation today, I'm concerned with the workspace, dexterity, and manipulability of these type of manipulators, since it hasn't been regarded thus far. Let's look to the joint space first. Here, in this case, we have a three-tube manipulator. And in this case, the joint space is six-dimensional, consisting of three, degree, three rotational degrees of freedom and three translational degrees of freedom, alpha and beta. By using the forward kinematic model, we can um, compute the space curve describing the center line of the manipulator in terms of arc length. Since the forward kinematics is kind of complex, we cannot not use geometric methods in order to obtain the workspace. So in this um, paper, we presented random sampling of the joint space. And our idea here is that we compute all end effector positions of the robot using this random sampling approach. And then we propose a volumetric representation, meaning that we subdivide the volume describing the workspace into isotropic voxels. And then by counting the number of end effector positions per unit volume, we get a measure for the redundancy for this unit volume. Here you see an example for a three-tube robot. The tubes are illustrated on the upper left. And on the right side, you can see scrolls through the XY plane and the XZ plane of the redundancy volume that we just generated. And you see here the wider a pixel is, the more dexterous the robot is in this place, meaning that more end effector positions lead to this particular um, voxel. You also see the 3D volume uh, rendering in the center. And if you want to know more about this method, about convergence, other examples, our experimental evaluation on a real robot and its applicability to any other robot structure, you can come see me tomorrow morning in the interactive salon from 9 to 1020. Thank you. So I'm Kevin Olds from Johns Hopkins University. I'm going to talk about a new robotic surgery system for otolaryngology head and neck surgery. So the system consists of a modular robotic manipulator, which is cooperatively controlled, which can be put together into different configurations to do different surgery types. So we did an analysis of several different types of surgery in otolaryngology and um, compiled a list of requirements. Mainly, uh, these surgeries tend to all involve operating through long, narrow tubes, like down the nose, down the throat. Uh, and we came with other specifications for requirement, uh, accuracy and other, other things. And we found that you can reconfigure the system quite effectively to do different surgery types, just by um, rearranging the same uh, modular robotic components. So here is the, how the system works. You just grab the tool, it has a four sensors, unmodified surgical tool. The pedal controls the gain, so how much the robot responds to you. It uses a hybrid linear delta mechanism to provide uh, three degrees of freedom of translation, as well as uh, we have two rotational degrees of freedom and a work volume about the size of a head. And the 
tool rotation is is passive. So to evaluate the system, we did a quick needle insertion experiment, which is designed to resemble a microlaryngeal phone of surgery. The objective is basically to just insert the needle through the holes without touching the sides, the operation game. And the, the system improved the accuracy of doing this from 28% to 91%. So it's a striking result. So here is what this looks like. This was the setup. Okay. And next, we're working on a more sophisticated evaluation. So this involves a similar type of setup. Now you're navigating the needle around the little spiral. That's a 1.2 millimeter spiral, heavily magnified with an endoscopic camera that's placed behind. So this setup has a realistic laryngoscope and uh, surgical instruments. So you can see uh, this is from a view behind with the endoscopic camera. So if you look on the left, you can see what this is. This is a skilled surgeon doing this, by the way. None of the surgeons were capable of doing this by hand. You can see the it flips to fail when they touch the edges. So if you have any other questions or anything about this, come to the interactive session tomorrow. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. I'd like to present a... Uh piece of work we've done on surgical structured light, the 3D minimally invasive surgical imaging. And so Columbia Engineering is my co-authors. Um, surgical structured light is a novel 3D imaging system for endoscopic surgery. It creates a viewable, real-time 3D model side by side with the 2D image to present to the surgeon. And the model can be used to perform accurate metrology on anatomy inside the body. It allows the in vivo model to be registered with other 3D sources such as CT or ultrasound. And in, essentially integrates many views to form a space-time model. So obviously, here's a picture of a, some anatomy. It would be nice if you had something like this, is what you have a 3D right next to it, and you can actually look at it from different viewpoints, which is what we're trying to provide. To understand it, we start with a, similar to a Kinect. So if you know how a Kinect works, it's a very similar idea. We're throwing down a small band of LED light through a very narrow notch filter in the blue spectrum through dispersion max, uh, mask, projects down a standard laparoscope, which is a projection channel, into the surgical site. We have another laparoscope, which is the outgoing channel, the imaging channel, and from that we get the normal image that the surgeon sees, along with this uh, dot pattern that we're putting down there. And you can see here we split it off with a beam splitter in the very narrow band blue, goes to the pattern camera, which we can use to do reconstruction of the anatomy, and we have the regular white light camera, which provides a standard image to a surgeon at the same time. Um, this is the prototype we built. So you can see we're using two laparoscopes. You could also do this with a stereo laparoscope and think of this as an add-on to that technology. Here's the projector, project down this stream, and then we do imaging through this, and here's the beam splitter back to the regular camera and the pattern camera, which is used for the reconstruction. So to give you an idea of how this works, here's a, an image seen by the uh, system in the regular spectrum, and then this is what we see in this notch filter, where we projected down a stripe pattern onto the scene, which that can be used using standard structured light ideas to create a depth map. And from that depth map, we can then mesh it and create an actual 3D model. And what's very nice is the fact that we can actually take these pixels, which have texture, and put them onto the model for a very realistic and accurate model. We can do metrology. Once we have the model, we can do measurements on it, so we can find out sizes of structures, tumors, etc. This is just a short video to give you an idea of the reconstruction. Here, we've reconstructed a plastic organ using this technology and showing you the textured map model that is left. Uh, this is a different uh, piece of plastic anatomy. We uh, did a plastic brain. You can see the reconstruction on that. And finally, the accuracy. This is a spantum, and we're within a millimeter or, uh, in distance and 0.2 millimeters in diameter on the cylinder. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ilya Palushin. I'm going to present the uh, work of a group of authors from uh, Western University in Canada, which is called Cooperative Teleoperation is Projection Based Force Reflection for Minimally, minimally Invasive Surgical Applications. 
Uh, the objective of this work is to evaluate the effect of a uh, special type of force deflection on algorithms, which we call projection-based force deflection, on stability and performance of uh, dual-arm haptic enabled teleoperator systems, system for minimally invasive procedures. Uh, the idea of projection-based force reflection was developed before. Essentially, we want to identify two different components in force reflection term, the interaction component, which the human actually feels, and the momentum generating component, which is essentially generating stability. And um, imp uh, we, uh, in this work, we implement these algorithms on experimental stuff shown here, which consists of two uh, haptic devices, uh, which, um, which are masters in this case, and, uh, which are masters, and um, two uh, Mitsubishi uh, seven degrees of freedom robots, equipped with uh, Da Vinci uh, tools, which are slaves. So um, we evaluated uh, performance of the uh, projection-based force reflection algorithms in comparison with direct force reflection on three different typical surgical tasks, uh, which are uh, not tightening uh, pegboard transfer and object manipulation. Uh, so essentially, in every case, uh, we uh, evaluate the average forces applied by the slave to the uh, to the task and average also average induced master acceleration accelerations of the master which is uh, generated by force reflection from the slave side. Uh, uh, experiments were performed for both cases of zero communication delay and uh, significant communication delay around one uh, one second uh, of round trip time. So essentially. Uh, some basic conclusions are shown here. First, we were able to show that there is a statistically significant effect on decreasing the induced master motion when using projection-based force reflection in comparison with uh, more traditional direct force reflection. We also observed significant uh, effect on decreasing average forces in two out of three tasks. Um, we uh, found that there is a substantially high success rate in the case of projection based on force reflection uh, for the task of, of uh, object manipulation in the presence of uh, communication delay. And uh, also, um, most participants expressed that uh, its system with projection based force reflection is easier to use and the force reflection feels like less disruptive in comparison with direct force reflection. Um, I'd like to invite you to, uh, tomorrow to discuss that also. Hello, everyone. I'm Xiaolong Liu. I'm a PhD candidate from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Today, I'm going to present the design of a unified active local motion mechanism for a wireless laparoscopic camera system. Single incision laparoscopic surgery is a popular surgery technique. It benefits less bleeding, faster recovery, and better cosmetic results compared with conventional multi-part surgery. However, the single incision limits the manipulation and the triangulation of surgical instruments, especially for a laparoscopic camera. To solve this problem, uh, fully insertable cameras are developed. The camera can be anchored uh, by external magnet and uh, manipulated by onboard motors. Researchers so far have addressed the separate mechanisms for fixation and manipulation. Inspired by a spherical motor, which use uh, spherically arranged uh, coils to control a permanent magnetic rotor, we propose a design to unify the camera's fixation and the manipulation mechanisms by adjusting input currents. Uh, unlike a spherical motor, our stator design uh, applies a flat coil arrangement in order to fit in the belly surface and the rotor are designed by using diametrically magnetized cylindrical magnets. The outer loop coils are coupling with two tail end magnets for pan motion, and the other sets of coils are coupling with the central magnet for tilt motion. To control the camera motion, magnetic force and torque are developed in equation one by assuming internal magnets are magnetic dipoles. To to calculate the magnetic field B, a unit current and magnetic field is firstly developed, and subsequently the whole field can be derived by using a uh, uh, by superimpos superimposing the field from all the coils. 
to evaluate the local motion capability, different size of coils are activated. Uh, the objective of this evaluation is to testify that data can provide sufficient force for fixation and the torques for pan tilt manipulation. Cody static evaluations are simulated under 35 to 50 millimeter uh, abdominal wall thickness, and the results show uh, the magnetic force and torque can overcome uh, the resisting forces and torques to achieve a 360 degree pan motion and at least the to achieve a 63.6 tilt motion. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Song Wong Yang. I'm a PhD student at the Carnegie Mellon University. Today, I'm going to introduce a, a technique for automated interocular laser surgery using a handheld micro manipulator known as a micron. Micron incorporate our six degree freedom miniatures the stud platform and also optical tracking system for the controls. The primary function of the micron is to actively compensate for the, the hand tremor while maintaining voluntary motion of the surgeons. In addition, new system micron enables the automated microsurgery by serving on operating tools. The, the, an application of the automated surgery, intraocular laser photo coagulation is primarily adopted since it is most common treatment for the retinal disease. So surgeon applies a pattern of the multiple bonds which requires high accuracy. It, it is also a very tedious procedures. Therefore, we propose automated or laser photocoagulations using the microns. Micron is held by a surgeon, such like holding the steel operations. A laser proof attached to the micron is precisely located on pre-planned -pre target while maintaining a specific distance the, from the retinal surface by virtual fixture schemes. As you might have been noticed in previous videos, the maneuvering of the surgical tools actually introduced the movement, movement of the eye due to the pivot constraint at the incision point of the, the eye. So our system is capable of the tracking sur surface of the eye in order to compensate any movement during the operations. Let me show some resulting videos for the unaided versus the aided the triers. The multiple patterns of links are introduced on fixed the fixed target surface. In the unaided triers on the, the top of the, these videos, we, we definitely observe the, the noticeable hand tremor resulting in large errors. On the other hand, for the aided triers, both the average errors and execution times are the significantly reduced compared to the unaided triers. Finally, the automated laser photocoagulation is demonstrated in the eye phenoms, the including compensation for the eye movement. So we have successfully achieved the automated laser photocoagulation. If you're interested in the, this work, please come to the, the interactive station tomorrow. Thank you. Um, good afternoon again. Uh, the work I'm going to present is called quasi-static modeling of the Da Vinci instrument. This work is uh, performed um, by doctoral student Farshat and Shakhpur uh, under uh, supervision of Professor Rajni Patel and Ilya Palushin. Uh, the main objective of this work is to develop a mathematical model uh, for Da Vinci instruments, specifically for endorheic grasper shown in this um, picture. And uh, the eventual goal of this model is we, we want to use this model for online estimation of the forces at the tip of the instrument. And eventually, we want to use this in a teleoperator system uh, with haptic feedback uh, from, from the tip of Da Vinci instrument without um, sensorizing this instrument, without necessary sensorizing this instrument. Uh, the major challenge here, of course, is the fact that behavior uh, of uh, dynamic uh, of mathematical model of this um, 
instrument is highly nonlinear. Um, it exhibits different effects such as uh, distributed frictions, uh, backlash behavior, um, tendon um, compliance, etc., etc. So the approach which is taken in our work is based on tendon shift analysis, uh, which is extended uh, in, in this particular work to the case of double tendon pulley system. Um, so this allows to just derive some kind of quasi static model that would describe this um, um, behavior of this um, instrument. And based on this uh, description, two simplified models were developed, which takes into which uh, approximately describe backlash effect, backlash-like characteristic of tendon-based transmission system. So these two models were uh, experimentally evaluated. Uh, we uh, performed experiments that um, where we estimate parameters of these models and performance of these models were evaluated and compared. We found a sort of interesting thing. Apparently, these two models describe different effects uh, or different aspects of backlash behavior. So the actual response is always between the responses of the models. So eventually, we found that there is a certain combination, weighted combina uh, combination of these two models that provide um, us with very with sufficiently precise um, estimate of the forces at the tip of the Da Vinci instrument. Um, again, uh, if you're interested, please come tomorrow to discuss the details. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my short presentation on design of a spine-inspired kinematic for the guidance of flexible instruments in minimally invasive surgery. My name is Matthias Träger, and I'm with the Institute of Microtechnology and Medical Device Technology of the Technical University Munich in Germany. The clinical procedure we want to improve is the so-called endoscopic submucosal dissection, or short ESD. The aim is to remove early stage cancer in mucosal tissue, and if possible, in one piece, the so-called or block resection. Therefore, the physician inserts a flexible endoscope with flexible instruments into the stomach via the mouth, the larynx passage, and the esophagus. The drawbacks are limited movements of the instruments. They can only be pushed forth and back in the working channels and only parallel to each other, so with two instruments, no triangulation is possible. Also, um, the physician can only apply limited forces with the flexible endoscope to the tissue. So we want to set up a system which is compatible to standard instruments and endoscopes and with which the physician can control two standard flexible endoscopic instruments independently for sufficient triangulation. The maximum total diameter is limited to 18 to 22 millimeters, um, which is due to the larynx passage as the narrowest point on the way to the stomach. Uh, the concept of a kinematic is a flexible arm, a kinematic inspired um, by the human spine to control the orientation of a flexible endoscopic instrument. The kinematic is actuated via push rods and bowden cables and produced by selective laser sintering of a biocompatible polyamide. With uh, one flexible arm, we can cover a workspace of about 70 times 60 times 30 millimeters and we can apply forces of five newtons in axial direction and two newtons in radial direction. This is a short demonstration. Oh, excuse me. On what we can do with our system, a simple pick and place task. And Afterwards, a short demonstration on the triangulation capabilities of our system by tearing a leaf in two pieces. Thank you very much for your attention and see you tomorrow at the interactive session. I'm Takayuki Kyoso from the University of Tokyo. Today, I'd like to present the work entitled Hybrid Control of Master Slave Velocity Control and Admittance Control for Safe Remote Surgery. Um, 
the remote surgery has been investigated in the last decade. And these are the pictures from the famous terabation between France and the US. Although some studies reported successful results of remote surgery, remote, remote surgery is not approved in, in any country because of safety issues. In remote surgery, the distance between the muscle side and slave side can be a thousand kilometers. And because of this large distance, the communication delay exists and communication can be unstable. Under this condition, the motion input at the muscle side may not be optimal and the unexpected accident may occur. And therefore, the safety mechanism is necessary to achieve safe remote surgery. So in this study, we aim to develop a control scheme to guarantee the safety of remote surgery. For this purpose, we proposed a hybrid control of relativity control and admittance control that enables to avoid the excessive contact force autonomously. And here is the overview of the proposed scheme. The system switches between the relativity control and the admittance control. And when the contact force is less than the upper bound, the system employs the right velocity control. And when the contact force exceeds the upper bound, the system is switched to the admittance control. And by switching this, these two control schemes, the system automatically keeps the contact force within the acceptable range. And when the system is, uh, when the contact force is less than the upper bound, the velocity of the the manipulator is proportional to the motion at the master manipulator. In this control loop, the, the control loop is closed using the communication link between the master side and the slave side. And when the contact force exceeds the upper bound, the system is switched to the admittance control. And in this control, the control loop is closed in the slave system, and therefore it is not affected by the communication delay between the master side and the slave side. And here is a demonstration of the developed system. When the contact force reaches the upper bound, the slave manipulator does not push the object, regardless of the motion input from the muscle side. And when the moving object makes a contact with the slave manipulator, the slave manipulator behaves compliantly and avoids the breakage of the instrument and the contact, uh, contact object. And I hope to see you at the interactive session four. Thank you for your attention.